after last week's khutbah, I was asked on more than one occasion if things are getting better for the Muslim world or worse. And frankly, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. No one does. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the future. But we can certainly glean things from the past which we use to give us direction. This kind of suffering was made all the, wor all the more worse when we were told that uh, the Indian government or Indian authorities have now taken to destroying the homes of Muslims who engage in acts of rebellion. Hmm. What does that remind us of? The destruction of homes. A very unique alliance that took place at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam between the Banu, Banu Nadir and the Banu Qaynuqa and the Kuffar of Mecca which ultimately led to the Battle of Khandaq. So these kinds of alliances, they underscore the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which says, Al-Kuffu Millatun Wahida that disbelief is one single community. It draws its own alliances. It finds strength within its own ranks. And uh, here we have evidence this week of that occurring. But in terms of pain and suffering, in terms of setbacks, the general principle in Islam is that with hardship come at ease. With every hardship come at ease. إِنَّمَا الْعُسْرِ yusra. That applies to us as individuals as much as it does to the community in which we find ourselves, as much as it does to the community at large in the Muslim world. It's very hard for us to accept that in our moments of grief. It is equally hard for us to understand and acknowledge that in our moments of joy and happiness grief is just around the corner. So a wise human being is one who tempers his grief as much as he does his happiness and his joy. This applies to all human beings, not just to Muslims. It should always be tempered, balanced. And when we carry this burden of Iman, and ultimately it is this responsibility a burden, then we have to recognize that it's something that underlies the whole idea of being a believer. It starts with the very best among us. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is reminded by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala by the grief and the calamity that his colleagues, his fellow Anbiya had to burden. وَأَيُّوبَ إِذْ نَادَ رَبَّهُ أَنِّي مَسَّنِيَ الضُّرُّ وَأَنْتَ أَرْحَمُ الرَّاحِمِينَ He says, recall the pain and the suffering of Ayyub, Job, whose story is so well explained in the Old Testament. As he was afflicted all kinds of afflictions, material, physical, social. Apparently, he belonged to a fairly well-off family, had a wonderful family, kids. And then things fell apart. And then ultimately, he was afflicted by some physical disease that made life intolerable for him. It is at this point that he reaches out to Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala records that and relays that to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa We have several instances in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa where he is grieved and he has to be reminded of the past, the calamities and the sufferings of people, of his fellow anbiya and rusul. 
and that this was part of that particular package. And then we have the greatest calamity that this community has faced. And that was the death of the Prophet Sallallahu For us, this is a two line, two paragraph event that we quickly gloss over. But if we stop for a moment to consider that particular moment, this was a community that had been brought together by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A community that was teetering on the brink of the fire of Jahannam. وَكُنْتُمْ عَلَىٰ شَفَىٰ حُفْرَةٍ مِّنَ النَّارِ فَأَنْقَذَكُمْ مِّنْهَا Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala reminds the Arabs of Mecca and of Medina that your relationship was so cantankerous, was so riddled with disunity that you were teetering on the edges of the fire of Jahannam. And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala then brought you together. So there was this the social glue that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam applied to the people of the Arabian Peninsula. This appendix to global history at the time, which apparently had no place in global politics. Arabia was a land you just crossed over. Arabia was not a land that you paid attention to. When Alexandria sent Alexander Right? He set out from Macedonia. Right? Don't remember. Uh, he went right past it. He went to India. So nobody paid attention to this land. It was occupied by several hamlets of warring tribes, leading rustic lives, with no tomorrow to think about. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends Rasulullah to this community. وَأَزْبَحْتُمْ بِالنِّعْمَتِهِ إِخْوَانَ And then ultimately before Rasulullah leaves this world, they become brothers. Brothers in faith. A very new kind of brotherhood. A very new kind of brotherhood. وَأَزْبَحْتُمْ بِالنِّعْمَتِهِ إِخْوَانَ This was a community that was re reminded repeatedly. لا يؤمنون حتى يحكموك فيما شجر بينهم. That they will not attain full iman until they accept you as their arbiter. And ultimately they did. So if there was a difference of opinion in that community, then they would, res uh, they would try and have that resolved through the intervention of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This was a, a religious requirement. And so they complied with that. It was a community that was ripe and ready. And Allah takes the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam away. I want you to think about that for a moment. This is the, the, the motorized equivalent of having your wheels come off. For 23 years there was this persona in front of you, this light, this beacon of hope and guidance, and then he's gone. Can you for a moment imagine the vacuum that he left? You have to do that to understand why Umar radiallahu anhu walked around with sword unsheathed. He says, whoever says Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has died, I will take his head off. Omar had his own way of dealing with such issues. And it is at this point that, uh, that Abu Bakr's leadership comes to the fore. And he tells Omar radiallahu anhu, Allah rislika ya Omar. Relax. And then he addresses the community as a leader ought to. مَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِمُحَمَّدٍ فَإِنَّ مُحَمَّدًا قَدْمَاتٍ He says, if you believed in Muhammad as a deity, as God himself, then know that Muhammad has died. وَمَنْ كَانَ يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ حَيٌّ لَا يَمُوتٍ And if you believe in Allah, then know that Allah is ever-living. He never dies. 
And then he started re reminding them of the verses that Rasulullah himself had recited unto them. وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ Muhammad is no more than a messenger. He is no more than a messenger. He is no deity. أَفَإِمْ مَاتَ أَقُتِلَ إِنْ قَلَبْتُمْ عَلَىٰ آخَابِكُمْ If he were to die or to be killed, will you then turn on your heels? They needed this kind of reminder because they were at a total loss. They were facing this dark vacuum. All they could see was Usr. And it came in waves. It came in waves. If you look at all of these calamities that take place after the Prophet Sallallahu has left this world, it is an effort to come to terms with who becomes your hakam? Who is the guide? when the guide is no more. The conflicts that take place at that early moment in our history, which we now know as Shia and Sunni, which we now know as Khawarij and, and Murji, all of these conflicts, they emanated from that particular core question. What happens now that the guide is no longer? That we now have this vacuum how do we settle our affairs? Who do we look to for guidance? So some reminded themselves that Rasulullah himself said that when I leave this world, you have the Quran and you have my family. So they followed the family. Others says, Rasulullah said, you have the Quran and you have my tradition. So they followed the tradition and so on. And out of this darkness came a new form of light. The ulama emerged. Muslim scholarship flourished. You had the Abu Hanifas of this world. We had people like Malik in Medina, Abu Za'i, Great scholars who you would agree would not have emerged if we had not experienced that darkness. So out of that darkness came a new light that allowed us to find our way through this new world without the direct guidance of the Prophet ﷺ. Without the direct guidance of the Prophet ﷺ. So you and I today face new challenges. The world is no longer regional, although our calamities are regional. But like I pointed out to you earlier on, they are connected. If we cannot make the connection, others are making that connection for us. They're making that connection for us in Jerusalem. They're making that connection for us in Delhi. But the connections are being made to deal with us, to deal with us, ultimately and finally. How we respond to that is the challenge we face for tomorrow. We need a new group of scholarship that addresses our issues, and these issues are enormous. What happens to those who can't take the heat? And there certainly are some amongst us who cannot. Even here, the Prophet Sallallahu guidance provides us with some hope. And he says, if things become too difficult for you, then move into your homes. Close your doors. Find peace in your solitude. Not all of us. Not all of us. But those amongst us who cannot take that heat. Or those who have been exhausted and need some respite. A temporary sojourn. Certainly, this is how we deal with these challenges. Ultimately, a Muslim is one who never despairs. He never despairs. لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله And despair not of the mercy of Allah. And despair not of the mercy of Allah. وَتِلْكَ الْأَيَّامُ نُدَاوِلُهَا بَيْنَ النَّاسِ 
And these days of pain and suffering, of joy and sadness, of affluence and poverty, we cause them to alternate amongst people. Yawmun laka wa yawmun alayka. Yawmun laka wa yawmun alayka. Today I am healthy, may Allah keep me that way. You are healthy, may Allah keep you that way. But you and I know there are absolutely no guarantees. No guarantees. We are physically well off in this country. Our Iman is always teetering on the brink of the abyss. If you spend some time with people like myself and others who have to deal with this at a daily level, the challenge of maintaining faith in a society like this will force you to reconsider your reasons for moving into a country like the United States in the first place. You may, have, you may now be far more wealthy than you could have dreamt of, only to find that your children are now having misgivings about belonging to the community to which they were born, subscribing to the faith that you and I have tried to teach them. May Allah protect us from this. This is a massive calamity. I know not if it is more big than the calamity that the people of India suffer, that the people of Syria suffer, that the people of Iraq suffer. For ultimately, theirs is a calamity that afflicts them physically, but they have no doubt about being Muslim. I cannot say the same for the generations in this country that are to come.